We have two talks on fast heart rhythm, so I'll try not to go too fast. Last year, I think I finished about 20 minutes early. So we'll talk about ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac arrest. So if you see SCA or SCD in the talk, we're talking about sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death. And we want to talk, first of all, about patients that are at risk so that you can identify them in your practice and know which patients are, are need to appropriately be referred to, to people like myself. And also a little bit about the kind of things in which these, these tests might show up uh, on the internal medicine boards. So we'll talk about what is sudden cardiac arrest, define the incident, uh, look, about, look at patients who have had MIs and heart failure. We'll touch upon some of the landmark trials that are, uh, in, that are, are uh, indications for implantation of defibrillators are based upon, and then how we can identify patients for primary prevention. So how big of a problem is this? Well, it's, it's really a, a huge public health issue, sudden cardiac arrest. Comparing it here to, to some of the other uh, problems that you, you hear a lot about uh, in the print and news media, things like breast cancer, AIDS, lung cancer. And these, these data are probably oh, more than five years old, but you can see the size of the, of the population that suffers a sudden cardiac arrest really dwarfs some of these other uh, disease populations. You have to combine all the cancers every year to, to account for more deaths from any cause other than sudden cardiac death. So what are the causes of these sudden cardiac arrests, these patients that drop dead, or the patient who tells you that their father dropped dead of a heart attack, or things like that? Well, these sudden cardiac arrests are, are largely arrhythmic, okay? You can see it, almost 90% of them are due to an arrhythmia. Only about 12% are due to an other cardiac cause. What kinds of arrhythmias? Well, predominantly tachyarrhythmias, okay? You see bradycardia there in that silver blue accounts for about 17% of the sudden cardiac arrest. The rest, that's 83%, are made up of ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and torsades, or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So who's at risk? Well, somebody who's had a prior sudden cardiac arrest. Makes sense. Somebody who has a family history of sudden cardiac arrest may be at risk for it, even in the absence of things like coronary disease or heart failure. People with congestive heart failure are at much higher risk. People that have had a prior myocardial infarction. Particularly people who have an ejection fraction of 35% or less. So 35%, no matter how, it got, how you got there, kind of defines a patient at increased risk for sudden cardiac death. So how can we effectively identify these patients? Well, on the, on the right there at the bottom, are some of the, uh, the uh, acronyms for some of the major trials that, that basically put people like me in business. Things like SCUD heft, made it two, AVID, CASH, made it one, must. Those identified the fact that patients with ejection fractions less than 35% or people that had had prior cardiac arrests, people with heart attacks, history of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, these trials identified that those people would benefit from defibrillators. So as you see, uh, the, the bar graphs on the left show that the incidence of sudden death is very high in those, in those patients. Whereas at the top, in the general population, the incidence of sudden death is very low. It's a very, you know, one, two percent. But if you look at the size, the bar graphs on the right, look at the size of the, the number of sudden deaths per year, a huge number of those occur in the people potentially that we would identify at low risk. So that's our real challenge for the future is how are we going to identify people that might be at risk for these things in the absence of some of these more obvious risk factors. So in terms of epidemiology, who are the people at risk? People with coronary heart disease, heart failure, congenital heart disease. Some people with neurologic disorders have an increased tendency towards sudden, sudden cardiac death. And some of those are actually bradyarrhythmias. There are people with structurally normal hearts. Uh, there's the so-called sudden infant death syndrome in the, in the very young. And then the, the cardiomyopathies, the people with dilated cardiomyopathy, perhaps from a virus, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, and the people with these uh, syndromes like arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, where normal heart tissue gets replaced with fibrosis and fat. So let's, let's do some audience response questions. So who is at risk for sudden cardiac arrest? A patient with a prior, prior sudden cardiac arrest, a patient with a family history, patient with congestive heart failure, patient who's had a myocardial infarction, all of the above. Good, so uh, essentially 
close to 100% of the people. Everybody was right, but the people who answered E were completely right. No partial credit. So I, I'm beating that into your head, obviously, that uh, these patients, these people who have all these risk factors are the people at risk. The kind of things that could show up in questions, you know. You'll, they'll ask you a patient with those types of, of characteristics. So there's different types of ventricular arrhythmias. There's the non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, which might, they all might, all the premature beats might look the same, monomorphic, in other words, or they might look different, like polymorphic, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. There are the sustained tachycardias, and again, monomorphic versus polymorphic. Uh, you would never need to know things like bidirectional or bundle branch reentrant ventricular tachycardia on a cardiology probably exam or even an, an internal medicine exam, but you'd have to know it on an EP exam. Torsades de points is this sort of twisting of the points and ventricular fibrillation. So you could see pictures of EKGs. This is a person with non-sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. They have normal beats interspersed with with runs of ventricular tachycardia that all look the same. So particularly on that bottom rhythm strip, you can see normal beats followed by three beats of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. But each of the beats looks the same. Compared, say, with this person, if you look at this rhythm strip, where they have frequent premature ventricular contractions sort of interspersed with normal beats, but the PVCs look different. Here's a person with sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. It's a 12 lead, that's why it looks different in the different leads, but you can see in each beat, they look very similar to the beat right before it. And luckily, this one breaks spontaneously to sinus rhythm at the bottom there. Sustained polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, you can see here, particularly like in lead two, where the, where the leads sort of change different, almost on a beat-to-beat -beat basis. This is an episode of somebody with bundle branch reentrant ventricular tachycardia. And the only thing to sort of show you here, this is somebody who has some, this is back in sinus rhythm. You can see P waves followed by QRS complexes. But you see that the morphology of the QRS complex actually looks the same in tachycardia and in sinus rhythm. So you could, you could easily think that this was just a supraventricular tachycardia in a person with, with a bundle branch block. It would take an EP study probably to, to prove that it was not. And here's somebody in ventricular fibrillation who gets shocked right down here in the end of the uh, picture back to sinus rhythm. So the clinical presentations of patients with ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac arrest, some of the people really have, have no symptoms at all and, and no EKG abnormalities beforehand. Um, some people, the more common symptoms are things like palpitations, dyspnea, some chest pain, dramatic things like syncope or, or uh, presyncope. So you can have ventricular tachycardia that's not stable. You can have ventricular tachycardia that's very stable. And in fact, when I perform ablation for ventricular tachycardia, I often have a patient in ventricular tachycardia for hours in a row while we're mapping things. And the patient may be awake and talking. Uh, patients with cardiac arrest. Uh, obviously much more obvious. So some of them have asystole, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and the dreaded pulseless electrical activity. So going back to our patients at risk for sudden death, talking about heart failure patients, when you look at this group of heart failure patients, the patients with ejection fractions less than 35 percent, the patients who have relatively mild to moderate congestive heart failure, their biggest threat is sudden cardiac arrest. So comparing, here's a patient with New York Heart Association class two congestive heart failure, meaning less severe. Here's a patient with New York Heart Association class three heart failure, more severe heart failure. You can see that 64% of the deaths in these patients are due to sudden cardiac arrest. Only 12% due to things like pump failure or other causes. As the patient gets sicker with heart failure, Sudden cardiac arrest makes up a smaller portion. And when you get down to the class four patients, it's sort of a 50-50. It's about a, it's about a third, a third, a third when you get to, to class four patients. So it's really the biggest threat to, to the patient with congestive heart failure who's otherwise functioning well. So people that have had a heart attack are about four to six, have a sudden death rate that's about four to six times that of the general population. So if you look at patients with sudden cardiac arrest, a previous MI is, in, is identified in about three out of four in them. And a previous MI raises the one-year risk of sudden cardiac arrest by 5% alone. So if somebody has a low 1% to 2% risk, if they've had a previous MI, 
their risk of sudden cardiac arrest may go up to six, seven, eight percent per year. And the five-year risk of sudden cardiac arrest with in patients with a previous MI, non-sustained, inducible, non-suppressible VT, and an ejection fraction less than 30 percent, 40 percent, is 32 percent. And that's based on one of our landmark trials, the MADIT trial. This was what we showed: is about a 32 percent decrease in, in survival in patients who didn't have defibrillators with those sorts of characteristics. So a reduced ejection fraction, or LVEF, is the single most important factor for overall mortality for sudden cardiac death. And what this is, this is comparing patients with lots of premature beats, okay? So the dark blue line is patients with no PVCs, then 1 to 10 PVCs per hour, greater than 10 PVCs per hour. So you can see patients who have normal ejection fractions, the survival curves are very similar despite the fact that some of them have lots of PVCs and lots of, some of them have very few. You go over here in the patients with LV dysfunction and the same burden of premature ventricular contractions now carries with it a, a much higher uh, burden or much higher risk of sudden death. So it's, it's ejection fraction that really defines our, our need for defibrillators. So despite improvements in medical therapy, symptomatic heart failure still confers a 20 to 25 percent risk of premature death in the first two and a half years after diagnosis. And about half of these are sudden cardiac deaths due to ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. All right, another audience response question. Most common cause of death in a patient with mild to moderate heart failure is pump failure. So this would be your New York Heart Association class one, class two. Most common cause of death. True or false? All right, so false. Again, very high percentage of you realizing that, in fact, sudden cardiac arrest is the most common cause of death in those patients. How do we survive it? Well, it really depends on how quickly we have access to things like defibrillators. So here, here's a graph that shows the re success of resuscitation versus time. <clears throat> 90% if you get resuscitated in less than a minute. You get out here to eight, nine minutes, and your, your survival rate's going to be less than 10%. So for every minute that goes by, the chance of successfully being resuscitated drops about 7 to 10%. You can see here, this is sort of dramatically illustrated. Here is a patient at 6.02 a.m. who develops ventricular tachycardia by 6.11. You know, nine minutes later, you've got a flat line there. Hopefully that's not one of my holters. The only effective treatment for sudden cardiac arrest is an electrical shock. It has to be delivered by either one of these external defibrillators or an implanted defibrillator. And time is critical. Again, for every minute in delay, you decrease your survival by about 10%. So what about antiarrhythmic drugs? Well, beta blockers certainly effectively suppress ventricular ectopic beats and arrhythmias. They seem to help reduce the incidence of sudden cardiac death. Amiodarone has never shown a definite survival benefit. Some have shown a reduction in sudden death in patients with LV dysfunction uh, when given in conjunction with a beta blocker, but it has a lot of complex drug interactions. About 40% of people on amiodarone long-term develop some sort of toxicity, be it pulmonary, hepatic, thyroid, cutaneous. Sotalol has been tested against defibrillators because it, it suppresses ventricular arrhythmias. It may be a little bit more proarrhythmic than amiodarone because of QT prolongation, but we've never shown a, a survival benefit from that. So the conclusion is, except for beta blockers, antiarrhythmic drugs are never really to be used in place of a defibrillator. They've never, they've never shown a survival benefit more than, than the defibrillator. So they've, this contest has been run multiple times in thousands of patients internationally, and the defibrillator always wins. Uh, what about things... Um, you know, either electrolyte supplements, other, other adjunctive therapies, things like uh, magnesium and potassium. They can certainly favorably in influence the electrical substrate involved in ventricular arrhythmias, but they're especially useful when the patient has low magnesium or, or low potassium. ACE inhibitors uh, and aldosterone blockers can improve myocardial substrate through some reverse remodeling. They certainly have been shown to be important in treatment for congestive heart failure, but unfortunately they have not shown any ability to reduce sudden death. The antiplatelet agents, the warfarin, again, may reduce some thrombosis, but, but you know, not necessarily going to be able to be used as primary therapy. And, and the statins are interesting because they do have 
uh, we do have some studies that show a decrease in the uh, ventricular arrhythmias in patients who have defibrillators compared to those who are not on them. But again, not, not something we can use as primary therapy. Another interesting thing would be the N3 fatty acids. They may have some antiarrhythmic properties, um, but there's some conflicting data as to whether or not they help prevent sudden death. If you look at uh, the, the trials that we've used to, to run that competition we're talking about of, of drugs versus the defibrillator, these are the results in their, their hazard ratios. And so if you look sort of consistently on all these trials that are over here, made it, avid, cash, cabbage patch, all these things, almost all of them show a definite benefit so that the defibrillator is better than not having the defibrillator. There's only a couple trials where the, the benefit was not present, one of which was this trial called Cabbage Patch, and it was patients with ejection fractions of 35%, and they went for bypass surgery. And so in that, in that population that got revascularized, they didn't have any benefit to the defibrillator. And then a, a recent trial where they put defibrillators in patients that had just had an MI within a, within a, you know, a month or so, and got a defibrillator when they had a low ejection fraction. Another trial in which there really wasn't a benefit to defibrillators. So it seems that for some reason, somewhere around 40 days after an event, if you still have a low ejection fraction, you consistently benefit from a defibrillator. Um, and if you haven't been revascularized, like in, in, in cabbage patch, and your ejection fraction stays low, you benefit from a defibrillator. But having things like bypass surgery does count for something. It does help the heart, and some of those patients recover and then don't benefit from the defibrillator. Even in this trial down here, this dynamite, where there wasn't a benefit for survival, there actually was less sudden death, as you might imagine. But other factors obviously played in there to not showing a benefit there. And this is the same data just in a tabular form, and I just highlighted in red those two trials that didn't show an advantage. But every other trial has consistently shown a decreased hazard ratio for the patient with a defibrillator compared to treating with medical therapy. So the implantable cardiac uh, defibrillator restores the heart rhythm, and it's the first-line therapy for patients at risk for sudden cardiac death. These uh, things consist of pacing, cardioversion, defibrillation treatments for the, for the heart and they all have, also have lots of programmable diagnostic functions. So all of the modern defibrillators have the ability to serve as a pacemaker as well. If a patient doesn't have any indication for a pacemaker, we can program the pacemaker portion of it to not work, uh, to, to basically be, be in sort of a monitor mode. But they all can function as defibrillators if they need to. So it's got several, function, several portions to it. It's got the device itself, which is in sort of the computer and the brains of the whole outfit. It's got the leads. Um, and the leads are two-way streets. They send the signal back to the defibrillator, and obviously that's how we deliver the shock as well. So sudden cardiac death can be prevented. <clears throat> the majority of cases are patients with coronary artery disease, a previous MI, low ejection fraction, or dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Defibrillation is the only option. And high-risk patients can be evaluated for known risk factors before they experience a sudden cardiac arrest. Ejection fraction remains a key factor. So let's do one more response question. So in which patient is a defibrillator indicated? A 74-year-old female with a history of coronary disease and ejection fraction that's reduced? <clears throat> a 25-year-old male with vasovagal syncope and, and PVCs? An 82-year-old male with metastatic lung cancer and ejection fraction of 35%? Or a 65-year-old female who has coronary disease, mild ejection fraction decrease, and doesn't want to take beta blockers or can't take them due to uh, fatigue and an ACE inhibitor causes a cough. In which patients should we put in a defibrillator? Okay, so a, a vast majority of you got that correct. The uh, first patient is the patient at risk. So why would we not do it in some of the other patients? Well, the person with vasovagal syncope has an other, you know, has another explanation for why they're passing out. It has nothing really to do with something that a defibrillator is going to treat. The 82-year-old might be indicated for a defibrillator, but if they have metastatic lung cancer, and again, always read the question. The, the questions on the boards are always, they always give you information in which you can base a decision on. But a patient with metastatic lung cancer probably has a survival of less than a year. So that'd be a patient we would not want to put a defibrillator into. And the 65-year-old female we're talking about there has really only very mild uh, left ventricular systolic dysfunction. So not necessarily somebody who's going to be at high risk for a defibrillator. So that's the reason why we didn't offer a defibrillator there. Conclusions. The key to sudden cardiac arrest prevention 
is identifying high-risk patients before they have a sudden cardiac arrest. And this is really, I think, a unique thing in internal medicine and, and cardiology and medicine altogether, the fact that we do offer these therapies as primary prevention. I think it really represents kind of a landmark or sea change in the willingness of payers and third party and the government to pay for these very expensive devices before somebody's actually had something happen. The majority of the cases are in patients who've had coronary artery disease or a previous MI. They have a low ejection fraction or a dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Those are the ways in which these questions would appear on the boards for you. They're going to have patients with those sort of obvious risk factors. And the patients like that potentially need to be referred to people like me. Does anyone have any questions?